Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to episode two of three in our series on stars. I am Trace. So far we've talked a bit about the classification of stars and stuff like that, but let's talk about the life cycle, okay? Let's kick into this. So now we know how stars formed and we wanted to know where the first stars to coalesce in the universe came from as far as we know. We all know that the Big Bang happened 13.7-ish billion years ago, and for the first few hundred million years, the universe was just too hot for stars to form. There's too much going on. We had to wait until things cooled down a bit. Gravity started pulling together hydrogen and helium into the first ever stars, and using all of those different laws and you know physics that we talked about earlier, if you haven't watched the last episode, go back and watch that, because it'll make a lot of this stuff Makes sense, but once that started happening, stars began to form. A 2008 supercomputer simulation, detailed in the journal Science, showed how dark matter gave us the first gravitational force, essentially. We aren't going to get into that too much, but it showed that the first protostar had about a 1% mass in comparison to our sun. So it was 99% smaller. Then, a mere 10,000 years later, it had a hundred solar masses. Previous estimations thought that these early stars could have been a thousand solar masses. You know, this is like when you look back in life and you got these giant animals and today we have these smaller animals. Things were huge in the early parts of the universe. But a study published in the same journal, Science, only a few years later proposed a different theory. According to the study lead and astronomer at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, it's a NASA laboratory, run by Caltech in Pasadena, Takahashi Hosokawa, the first stars were definitely massive, but not to the extreme that we thought before. Our simulations reveal that the growth of these stars is stunted earlier than expected, resulting in similar sizes to what we would find today. Only around 10 solar masses, not 100 or 1,000 as previously thought. The reasons we thought that these early stars were so big was because stars come from these collapsing clouds of helium and hydrogen. Remember, we mentioned this earlier, and there are trace amounts of heavier elements in the universe that contribute to these star formations. Remember that, because that's very important. Put a pin in that. Heavier elements, very important. Because for a star like our sun, you need heavy elements like carbon. It helps keep the collapsing gas cool enough so it doesn't expand too much. The star doesn't blow itself out. So basically, if the heavier elements weren't there, the star would expand to these massive sizes. And that was exactly the case in the early universe. Those heavier elements weren't there yet. So the stars got bigger. But this new simulation showed that the old simulations were a little inaccurate. They were saying thousands of times. The new simulations were saying, eh, it's really more like tens or whatever. Not that big. In the early universe, the first generation of stars, today we call population three stars. Astronomers believe these lived very short, violent lives, lasting only about a million years until they exploded into supernovas, or supernovae. In that short million years, the heavier elements that you needed to make the stars that we have today were actually created in their cores. So these stars were fast, crazy rock and roll stars blowing themselves out after only a million years, but in doing so, they were fusing lots of hydrogen and helium together in order to make heavier and heavier and heavier elements. Once those elements existed in the universe, other stars could grab onto them to make themselves a little cooler, like we just mentioned. Eventually, those stars became stable, they lasted longer, got into middle age, you know, bought a minivan, kind of calmed down a bit. So that's population three stars, rock and roll stars. They didn't have very much metal, ironically, uh, and they were the oldest, they were the first stars. But according to the Center for Astrophysics and Supercomputing in Swinburne, population three stars, they're just hypothetical. We can't really observe them because they're not around. And there are a few theories as to why. One thought is that population three stars would have swept through the universe, and as they collected metals, they would now appear as what we call population two stars. But the most reasonable idea is that it's just been too long. There aren't any left. We would only be able to see what's left over from population three stars' deaths if we look way out into the universe. Because the further away you look, the further back in time you're looking, because speed of light is constant. So if you're looking at a star that's so many light years away, say 10 billion light years away, the light is just getting to you now, but it was emitted from that star 10 billion years ago. So that's why they say they're looking back in time the further away they look. Maybe we just need better telescopes or 
something else to try and figure out how to see 13 billion years back in time, right? Then we can see those early population three stars. But today we've got population two stars. They've got some metal in them. They're still known as metal poor. Then there's population one stars. They've got a lot of metal in them. Uh, they're younger. They've only formed in the last million to 100 million years, which in the age of the universe is kind of insane that we are seeing some of these very new stars. They're basically freaking babies. But these are the different types. You know, you got the rock star stars, you got the minivan stars, and then you got the old people that are full of metal. It's kind of weird to think about, but it's true. So stars last a long time, but it depends on the mass of the star how their life cycle in a population two star is going to go. When a collapsed molecular cloud isn't large enough and nuclear fusion doesn't happen at its core, we get a star called a brown dwarf. They're too large to be planets, too small to be stars, and nuclear fusion isn't there. They're not hot enough. Brown dwarfs don't shine. They're not actually brown either. It's more of a color between red and black, but we're not going to get into that because that's kind of weird. But brown dwarfs, it's kind of like a big star-like thing. When nuclear fusion is triggered, like we mentioned earlier in the previous episode, you get main sequence stars, stars with higher masses and more material, and they will last longer because they have more to burn, right? That's not actually true. That's wrong. They actually burn through that material faster since its core temperature is significantly hotter, which is kind of crazy to think about, right? Our star is going to last about 10 billion years. But a star 10 times the size of our sun wouldn't last 10 times as long because it's bigger. It would actually only last around 20 million years, a really short amount of time. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Eventually, everything is going to die, even stars. So now that you know how they're born and how to pull them together into different types over the life cycle of our universe, Let's talk about how stars die and what happens to them tomorrow. Make sure you come back for that. Subscribe so you get all the episodes of D News Plus in this series. Let us know down in the comments if you uh, want to know more about anything else. Oh, me and producer Blair can only brainstorm so much before we start running out of ideas, so give us some. And thanks so much for tuning in. You can come find us on Twitter at D News. You can find me at Trace Dominguez. We'll see you tomorrow.